Okay, this video is the making of this green velvet bodice from Outlander season one, so let's just get moving. Let's talk about patterning. I don't wanna get nearly as in depth with patterning in this video because I just made this entire pattern for the blue laced jacket video and I don't wanna repeat myself too much, but I did do a lot of alterations to the pattern. I put in almost a full day's worth of work of just fine tuning it to my measurements. You know, like quarter an inch here, eighth of an inch there. It was such like minutia that I don't feel like it would be super educational for the video, but I'll go over the most important things I noticed. A while back, I started using cotton canvas for mocking up my stay patterns, and I decided to try it this time with the bodice, and I highly recommend that. I recommend using really stiff fabric like canvas for any outfit or bodice or jacket that is going to have any kind of rigidity and structure, and that's because it really shows you where there's going to be any wrinkles or fit issues. The big thing that I altered with the pattern is I separated out the side piece from the back and added another flare. And then the other big thing I noticed is that the front bust seam is actually important. I figured out the reason for that seam beyond just construction. It actually does have a fit purpose. It pinches in just slightly under the bust. That does not make it a princess seam. I will say this again and again. People call Outlander jackets inaccurate because they say that it has princess seams. Maybe some of them do, but just because it is located where a princess seam is located and maybe even shaped like a princess seam does not make it a princess seam. A princess seam has a function and a very specific fit. Even though it draws the fabric in only about a quarter of an inch under the bust, that does not make it a princess seam. What that does is make it a prow front seam. So I've noticed this about Outlander costuming. They basically took all of the 18th century and pick and chose what they want from it, which I am okay with because they came up with something very cohesive and very beautiful. It's a form of world building. With Outlander having a bit more of a fantasy element, I think it is completely appropriate that they would do world building and take all of these different elements of 18th century and come up with their own unique style of dress. So they chose to make the bodices prow front. Um, prow front is basically late 18th century when, you know, just before the like early Regency styles began to set in, it incorporates just a little bit more of your natural curve. And I think for the kind of relaxed 18th century vibe they were going for, very like mundane and ordinary wearable, I think that it works much better than a very rigid looking straight front bodice shape. So that is my defense of Outlander <laughs> seams.
need to explain something. If you watch Makara Tour's videos, do you remember in the old ones when, probably the new ones too, when she would finish the bodice by taking the outer layer and the lining layer and stitching them together at the top and bottom edge and then turn the right side out and then stitch the side seams. The first few times I saw her do that, I was like crying. I was like, that's not how you sew. <laughs> <laughs> but here we are a few months later and I'm going to try it. Okay, so here are the pieces all laid out and what I did was I lined all of the outer and lining layers up together. I pinned and stitched the bottom edges. I pinned and stitched the arms eye edges. And I pinned and stitched the front edge and the neckline in the front and the back. So that when I turned all of these pieces right side out, <laughs> you would have the seams left to finish off and then just the shoulder edge. But yeah, that's how I constructed it. Okay, that whole pile is done. So what I need to do with this is I need to stitch the edges again with the machine this time. Then I need to trim the edges and then I need to clip all of the curves. And then I need to fold it over and top stitch on the lining side. is basically done, which means that tomorrow I can lay out my pattern pieces and trace the side seams. I'll have to baste them individually before I baste them together. Um, and then machine stitch it, and then uh, start felling those seams, and that will be 
basically it for this bodice. There will be some like different finishing details, but that is gonna be the main construction. I think I am going to do some top stitching on this piece because it's so bubbly. Um, and then, oh, the other thing is on the outer strap pieces, I decided that I'm going to go back and put in some interfacing and then maybe even stitch in a little scrap of thicker fabric and that is to reinforce the eyelets later. Okay, yes, this edge that I just basted is now laying nice and smooth, unlike this one, so it'll be a lot easier to get it even when I'm stitching it to the side front panel. Okay, this one is done and ready to sew, but first I have to do all of the rest of that. So that'll be my morning and probably afternoon. Okay, there's the back all basted together, and there are the other pieces ready to go. So now it's time to start pinning and basting the seams, which if it's 3.30 now, will probably take most of the day. Try and get this done by the end of New Year's, and preferably one more project too, because if I finish this, I'll have finished 19 projects in the year, and finishing 20 projects in 2020 just sounds better, so. <laughs> Okay, well, as I predicted, that did take all day to base together, so um, it's only 9.20 right now, so maybe I'll get these stitched on the machine before I call it quits for the day.
Okay, here it is. I have stitched all of these side seams on the machine and they are all going to be very strong. I want to delay finishing them because I want to be able to try it on and make sure the fit is exactly perfect. So I think the next thing I'm going to work on tomorrow morning because I'm done for the night. Tomorrow morning I'm going to start with the boning channel at the center front so that I can add the hooks and eyes and give it a real try on. I'm also going to have to mock up the shoulders somehow. Probably just pin them. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're getting to a little bit more complicated spot, so voiceover time. To insert the boning, when I originally stitched that facing piece wrong side out, I left about an inch wide gap at the front corner to insert the boning through. So I inserted the boning through that opening, I wedged it up against the very front edge seam, and then I loosely pinned it in place. And then I came through and stitched it in place by hand with a back stitch, and then I attached the hooks and eyes on the inside along that sewn edge. And I slip stitched close the opening at the top for the boning, and then the closure was done. Maybe a tiny bit loose right here. Well, hot damn! So after I was done trying it on, on each of those four flared seams, I marked a little bit over an eighth of an inch from the corner and then moved that seam in a little bit by stitching it and then seam ripping out my old seam allowance. The peplum is very, very, very wide and it would be perfect if I was going for something more screen accurate and was planning on wearing a bum roll underneath it, but I'm not and I'm not sure if I like the, you know, look. <laughs> so I think that I'm going to taper it in at least at the front edge. I also like that when I taper in, I kind of smooth out the lines that are forming right here. And then the back, I might taper it in a bit too. We'll see. I'm just, I'm gonna do this first and then bind them in an order that will give me space to keep trying it on and making alterations as I go. Now to bind the seams, my original plan was to just double fold down each seam allowance and then fell it down like normal. But the problem was that the velvet was very difficult to work with and also it had gotten too short in some places. It just wasn't really going to work well. So what I decided to do was cut strips of the linen and then just cover each seam. So how I prepared this tape is I cut two inch wide strips and then I ironed them in half. And then I took the sides and turned them back individually to basically make a half inch wide accordion folded type strip. To sew that on, I opened each seam allowance and I trimmed it to about half an inch. I used the inner fold of that tape and stitched it down like stitching in the ditch along the center of each seam allowance. And then I folded the edges of the tape under the seam allowance and filled them down on each side. And then I pinned the shoulder seams back into position so that I could give it a real try on. And you'll notice that my clips are getting a bit spotty here of what I actually have footage of. And that just kind of shows you my level of motivation at this point in the project. Okay, so here's what we've got so far. Everything seems to be fitting pretty good. I have the shoulder straps uh, basted into place. I haven't machine stitched them yet. Um, I'm happy with everything except for these little uh, flares here. They're just too, they're more than I want. So I'm going to pinch them in place kind of how I want them and then um, go restitch them. I think the back is fine though. I think I can go ahead and finish off the center panel and then finish off the center pleat. Okay, so here's what we're looking at right now. I have finished altering the flares. I still think that they're not exactly screen accurate, but I think that they're very good for the slightly altered silhouette that I'm going for. I like the way it splits a little bit at the bottom because that is how the screen accurate one looks. Um, it's very booby. I might have, you know, raised the neckline a bit, but oh well. I really like the fit of the pattern. Like, yeah, that's the thing, like this pattern fits so much better than the last one, but it's hard to tell because it's such wrinkly velvet. It's a little bit of a shame because this is like my favorite bodice of hers. And I was like, oh, well, if it doesn't turn out great, I'll just remake it at some point. And I'm like, no, <laughs> never. So this one is almost done. I just need to uh, finish off the last inside edge that I have altered. And then this piece will be done until I can do the sleeves and then I'll need to do eyelets on both of them. I need a project to last three days because that is like the perfect amount of time to get really invested and then be done. And the last one took five days and I was like, uh, this is too much, I'm getting bored by the end. 
And then this one's taken me like two weeks because I just can't stand to work on it. Yeah, we'll see what I decide to do next. But, I mean, look at the shape of that. That is a very exaggerated 18th century hip going on right there. <laughs> Okay, so what exactly is wrong with these sleeves? For one, the pattern is completely wrong, which I knew that was the case, but at the time I just didn't care. But let's make a, let's make a better effort this time. Um, it shouldn't have the slope, and Claire's don't have the little tuck either, but they do have a seam up the front as well as the back. So that is kind of the big thing. But then the other problem is that I thought I could make a pattern that I could use for lace on or sewn on sleeves and just like have the same pattern for both. That does not work because this is so different. So what I need to do is shave a little bit off of this top edge and then add a little bit more to this bottom edge because it doesn't need to have nearly as much of an upward slope if it's not going to be sewn inside and you know, have room for flex. So yeah. But I really do love the shape of this sleeve. I will definitely keep this pattern for future projects. Now, for repatterning these sleeves, I originally tried to just alter my existing pattern, and it turned out very, very strange looking. I basically started from scratch and kind of freehanded it because I wanted it to be very symmetrical. So I basically started it over and I followed the measurements from my previous pattern at the, you know, underarm about halfway down the sleeve and then at the hem of the sleeve and made sure that my pattern ended up as the same width in those places as the original pattern because I did like the way it fit in that regard. And then I had to majorly raise the lower edge and lower the top edge to make it fit that laced on silhouette a bit better. Okay, sleeves are cut out and I'm going to stitch these almost identically to the way I stitched the last set of sleeves. I sewed the lining and the outer sleeves individually with the side seams, and then I lined them up right sides together and stitched the top edge, clipped and turned it right side out, and then I hand folded, pinned, and stitched down the lower edge. The only problem with this was, once again, velvet. I cut like three quarters of an inch seam allowance, and I don't know where it went. And then to finish them, I used the exact same eyelet placement from before on both the jacket and the sleeves, and I used some green embroidery thread. Okay, well, it is done. I feel like I should be more excited right now, but honestly, I'm still kind of mad at it, so... <laughs> okay, well, I'm less mad at it now. I actually took it out and got to wear it around a bit, and it's like, okay, you're not that bad. So, okay, thoughts on this project. Number one, the Makara Tours method of you know, doing the finishing first. Um, I like it, actually. I'm surprised by how much I like it, but I do not know where my brain was when I decided to try it out on this project with velvet. That was a garbage decision. I am going to try it again with just like a nice sturdy wool. I think it's very important with sewing or with any hobby or skill you're trying to build to narrow down what exactly draws you in and keeps you engaged and gives you that sense of fulfillment and accomplishment. And to some people it might be different. They might love the slow process of hand stitching or, you know, any other thing. Like obviously Angela Clayton loves the embellishing aspect. There are different things that matter to different people and I love the patterning. I love the geometry. I love like taking a flat piece of fabric and figuring out how to precisely make it into the 3D shape you want. To me, that is so fulfilling. I love doing that. And so therefore, the faster I can finish a project, the sooner I can start a new project and try out a new pattern. So I've decided that I just want to try different things to see if I can find the best balance. Because that is the other thing I love about history bounding. You're drawing from everything. You're drawing from all different eras. You're drawing from the modern. You're drawing from tools we have available today. And you're incorporating the best, most effective and efficient elements of that to do the best work you can, and that is what I love. Anyways, that went long. Other thoughts? Um, okay, about the pattern, I'm 95% happy with it. One difference between the screen accurate one and mine is that it has a flare right in the center front area here. I got rid of that flare because I realized that the reason for it is because of the bum roll, and since I'm not wearing a bum roll, I of course need the flare for the back and sides of the hips, but I don't really need one for the front. So I got rid of that flare, 
But the problem I have with this flare is that it's a little bit tight right here and it kind of forms a wrinkle. I think the cause of that is that I have an equal proportional amount of flare on each side and I think I need to increase the amount of flare on the front but not the back. So that's one thing I want to tackle for next time. Um, uh, let's see, other things. The back I'm happy with, the shoulders I'm happy with. Um, oh, I might actually lower this edge a little bit. I really wanted to have the slope here, but I feel like it's actually more extreme than it is in the show, so I might lower this edge maybe half an inch or three quarters of an inch. And then the sleeves, I'm much happier with my pattern and I will do a more thorough tutorial. I think I figured out how I came up with it or how to come up with a sleeve pattern. It took so much work because like, and I didn't know what I was doing. So it'll have to be in another video. I think I've kind of solved it, but I want to do another test before I really get in depth with how to do it. Okay, the other thing is, all right, velvet. Velvet is terrible. Tips for sewing with velvet. Number one tip, don't sew with velvet. <laughs> but if you insist, I have sewn with velvet, but it was like five years ago and apparently it was such a horrible experience, I blocked it from my memory because I don't actually <laughs> remember much. It's very lightweight, it's very like thin and slinky, and it would have been much easier to work with if I had used a very stiff linen for the lining. That would have been a lot better. Uh, two, the whole Makara Tour is turning it wrong side out thing. It just, it wasn't a good idea for this project because this velvet would have been much easier to work with if I had flatlined it to something very sturdy and rigid first. Then the other thing is, I think that I would have just hand stitched the whole thing because I ended up having to hand stitch every single seam anyways before I even touched it with the machine. So if I was gonna do that, I might as well have just done a stronger back stitch and just hand stitched the whole thing. It's just like, I mean, really, if you've never worked with velvet, you just, it, it just, it, it's like, it's bad. It's impossible to keep it from sliding. As soon as you put pressure on two pieces together, they just start to shift. And then as soon as you start to sew it, they just keep shifting. So, <laughs> Anyways, so yeah, thanks for watching. If you want to continue the progress, go ahead and subscribe. Yeah, I think we're done here. 